Hi there. Hi, Emma, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great, thanks. Just making sure. Could I quickly test sharing my screen with you? Absolutely. Okay, great. So if I click share, mm -hmm. and then I click that, and I click share. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Okay, and what happens when I click this button? What can you see? Now I can actually, now it's full screen the presentation. Before that I saw the presentation in the foreground and your background in the background. Great, but now you see the full presentation. Yes, I but do. But you don't see my next slide screen. No, I don't see your next slide Okay, screen. perfect. Thank you. Wow, that's actually really easy. It is fairly easy. I, I'm just always nervous about them starting the meeting because I don't even have the password. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but... <laughs> the um, what we use for our NOAA telecons is so complicated, and they change the user interface like every six months. And oh my gosh, that was so obvious. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll just go on mute again. Okay, me too. Thank you.
No, this one says L. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Let's see, how can I? May, your video is kind of funny. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Okay, fantastic. I'm I'm about to to board, so uh, I may not be here for long. But I wanted to be here at least in the beginning of the call. <clears throat> All right. Okay, we're almost ready. There's only one more minute to go. <laughs> How about I put the the dog for the day in the chat so that everybody has it. Washington passenger Robinson, Tiffany Robinson to the podium. Whoever that was, I don't I don't understand what you just said. It was garbled. Was that Suzanne? I don't know. No, it was, it was Daniel. It was stuck in the background at the airport. <coughs> oh, I, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm going to mute myself. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen at first. Hopefully you can see it. Yep, it's visible. Good. Let me make it bigger. Now go away over here. Oh, wow. Technology. All right. Okay, I would say let's get started. We have a good number of people here. All right. So, um, first of all, is there anybody new on the, on the line? And if so, can you just unmute, unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the group? Anyone new? Am I? I suppose I'm new. <laughs> okay. But Go I'll ahead. introduce myself later. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, let's get started. Um, so first of all, here's a request, Suzanne, from you uh, for annual report contributions. Is that still valid or did you, did you submit the annual report by now? Suzanne? I'm wondering whether she's, she's still on the call, but okay. So um, I'm going to double check with Suzanne. Oh yeah, because it says by August 16th over here. So I think this is an old item. So I think we can skip this one. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Our web pages always need some updating. And in particular, we always need somebody to help us to get the videos from past presentations online. I think we'll, I think we're way behind right now and we want to bring it all up to up to current date. So if there's anybody or anybody a student or postdoc who would want to do a little bit of work, it's not that much work really. 
even if you just tap us once, that would be great. Um, we're also looking for a new setter editor. Um, if we go ahead with a new setter. So, so those are the three things that we could really use help with the web pages, getting the videos online, and potentially a new setter. Um, okay. Recent events, does anybody hey, want so, to- Sorry to jump in, my, my yeah. uh, microphone was broken earlier. My name is Jim, I work for Liz Moyer in Chicago. So I'm- uh, Oh, new cool. Okay, and what do you do with Liz? Uh, I work on the uh, climate impact side of things, but I'm interested in the talk today, so. Okay, are you a PhD student, postdoc, faculty? Uh, yeah, PhD student starting my third year. Okay, cool, welcome. Thank you. Liz is, is a great person. All right, okay. Uh, does anybody have anything to say about this past event? Who's on the line today? No, okay, then let's move on to the next one. Amy, you wanna talk about the AI conference? I mean, abstracts are closed, but is there anything you wanna say? It was the largest conference, that we've, the largest number of submissions we've ever had. We're filling two full rooms for four straight days. It's gonna be amazing. Okay, and people can of course still register. You can go even if you don't have a presentation. So, right, and the schedule will be out, I believe, later this week. Okay, cool. Can you cite abstracts then too? Will they be online? Can they be linked into something? Yes, the abstracts and the entire session will be there, and then um, after the meeting's over, they'll have the recordings up. Okay, very cool. What are the dates of that meeting? Um, I believe it's January. It's the second week of January, and I will tell you really fast. Uh, January thirteenth to the sixteenth. Okay, they're faster than me. Okay, it's in you. my calendar. <laughs> and it's in Boston, right? Yes. So, and and this is of course this is a big AMS annual meeting, and this is one of the conferences there. So, if you're interested in anything related to meteorological society are uh, this is the place to go and this is just one of the conferences there but please do join I us i should also mention that we have um three tutorial sessions the weekend before and those are all filling up really fast as well so if you want students to go learn more about machine learning and ai um for meteorology particularly we're going to be running some great tutorials including a hackathon are those linked into the conference website how do you can can you find out about those i'll drop a url in for you um and Libby please do Libby's student and my PhD student are co-chairing the tutorials. Okay, so just put a link over there. I'll do that, give Please. me two seconds. Okay, thank you. Okay, who wants to talk about the next one? I heard May is, is on the call. May, do you wanna talk about this one? Hi, Hi. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, I can do that. So the, G, the GSA meeting, we're having a session as it says, on information systems of the geological sciences, reaching for the future. It's on Tuesday of that week. Um, and we have some really nice invited speakers and it is in Phoenix. So uh, uh, I, I don't know how many geoscientists we, you know, this, this conference really caters more to the geo side of where the AMS is catering to the <laughs> <laughs> IS side, um, uh, uh, but so this is, I guess, um, probably for most of this group, we'll just use this as a demonstration of how uh, this group, how, how this group is allowing us to go in both directions and extending ourselves in both directions. Um, I, uh, I don't have anything, we, we got a pretty good set of abstracts and um, we have an oral session and which is not guaranteed, you have to get enough speakers. So uh, the session has been doing well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the KCAP conference. So Danielle is probably on the plane by now, so I don't think he can talk much about it. Okay. No, 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 I haven't, I haven't boarded yet. Okay, go can ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is the International Knowledge Capture Conference. It's going to be happening in in Marina del Rey, and we are um, organizing a workshop for capturing scientific knowledge. And I think it fits very well the the, the scope of, of ISGEO. In fact, last time, uh, Suzanne was the one who gave a talk, uh, like the keynote of the workshop, and it was very, very entertaining. So um, I, I would like to encourage you to submit. Uh, I think 
um, some of of you are already planning I, uh, because because they have to, I mean you have told me <laughs> and uh, it would be it would be great to have as many contributions from this community as possible and uh, papers are I mean it's not difficult to submit even a position paper we have like uh, papers can be uh, four pages or six pages so it's not like uh, significant uh, in terms of time that you have to spend so if you have a new crazy idea for capturing um, scientific knowledge so we we want to hear it very cool and the deadline is the 27th of September yeah but if you have any trouble making that deadline write to me and and we'll try to figure it out sounds great all right uh, next on is the AGO fall meeting and I start with the discussion of what happened so basically uh, all the mergers took place uh, about two weeks from now and then the following week we already had to arrange all the abstracts and decide who is who's going to give oral and poster presentations and just to give a quick overview so the machine learning session by Ben and others stayed separate because it was big enough so we have an oral and a poster session there then there was another machine learning session by Karthik with a different emphasis. And that one merged with Dan's session uh, that was supposedly to be a panel session. And AGU really messed up there because in previous years, you asked for a panel session and when you got it, you basically had eight thoughts and you had to fill those and then that's done. But this year, they said, well, okay, see how many abstracts you get and then we see whether you're a separate panel session or not. And they really had no special treatment for those. So at the end they said, well, you only have eight abstracts you have to merge. But then uh, Karthik and then were really creative and figure out how they can come up with the merge setup where they take the best abstracts from both sessions to have something of a panel discussion at the end of the session. So they have an oral session and, a, um, and an e-lightning session now. Um, yeah. And I didn't yeah. even realize that. Dan, you just ended that, right? I thought it was an oral and a poster session. So then uh, why, why don't you talk yeah. about it? Uh, in fact, uh, given, uh, given the success of last year's, uh, we ended up just uh, creating the panel session uh, in the exact same, uh, in the same uh, uh, realm as last year's. Uh, so it's uh, four speakers with a uh, no, 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 with panel and then uh, that are grouped by like topics and, uh, and then another uh, for uh, 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 four speakers, and they go directly into panel right after. So, I, I last year's I thought was very successful. So we worked on keeping that format, and then we pushed everyone else off into an e lightning, which I, which we have still not confirmed. Everything is okay with that, but uh, we but, uh, are we're waiting on the next steps to hear to hear back from. Uh, AGU. Suppose that they have changed it to an e-lightning, uh, but I was under the understanding that uh, people had to volunteer to be in an e-lightning. So we'll figure that one out. But Okay. But you said the, the oral session is now four speakers, then panel discussion, and another four speakers and panel discussion, just like last year? Correct. Uh, I think we're going with 10 minutes each uh, with no questions, uh, followed by a panel session where the questions uh, can be asked of, uh, uh, of any and all. And one of the invited speakers is Amy, who's on the line. So she's going to be one of them. All right. And she's. Uh, actually, I was just going to ask um, do you guys have dates for this now, or is that not available? Nope, yet? not until October. That's yeah. AGU for you. Okay. All right, then the education Amy, session. Amy, do you have the week at least? Oh, do, do you have, we have the week? Oh, of course we have the week for AGU. Yeah, that yeah. is like, let me just check. just wanted to make sure she had that. Yeah, we don't have the specific day yet. No, she knows which week it is. Yeah, it's in my calendar, but I can't stay the whole week. So I'm sincerely hoping we can get a day nailed down soon. Yeah, it's usually the beginning. And she's going to be an invited speaker in our session, the first session too. <laughs> anyway, okay. so. Yeah. They should be on. on dates in about a week or a couple yeah. weeks. Okay. All right. So the education session was very small. I think it had like five abstracts, but they decided that they were just going to stay separate and have a lightning session, which I thought was a very cool idea. E-lightning session. Thank you. Do we have anybody, Arhun or anybody else from that group on here today? I don't see anybody. I don't think so. Okay. Then the session that Mary and several of us proposed uh, ended up merging with two other hydrology sessions. And it was another thing that we learned is 
it's really important to think about which your main session is going to be, which section you're going to be in when you submit abstracts or when you submit session proposals to AGU. Because after the first week, they only allow you usually to merge with another session that's in your own section. So if you have a priority session that has a lot of machine learning to do, you can't easily merge with somebody ESSI because it's a different section. So you have to think carefully ahead of time about which section you want to submit in because then that limits your merging capabilities. But we were glad we figured out a good match there. So we're going to be part of a SWE hydrology session group. And uh, May, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, the one we're going to link with, is, the main one we're going to link with is the, um, uh, is, is one that has been um, dealing with like metrics and um, modeling and metrics and diagnostics um, and has tends to draw a large crowd. So um, we'll get, our speakers will get a little bit of special knowledge, acknowledgement and treatment and just identification of ISGO and, um, uh, and I think it will go well. So um, the woman who uh, that has been doing that session the last few years is great. And um, her name's Julianne Ma from uh, uh, Waterloo, University of Waterloo. And um, so I think, it will, I think it will go well. Yes. And of course, we have a little bit less, imp let's put it this way, ISGO doesn't stand out as much, but our people will stand out in this session because we're the smallest group out of three different groups that are merging. And then finally, Ibrahim's session merged with another session. That was the only merge I wasn't involved in, so I don't actually know which session they merged with. Um, and I don't see Ibrahim on the call. So, but anyway, that went well too. They merged with one other session. Seems to be going okay. All right. So we have a big, big presentation at AGU this year. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, you can ignore the separate website here. The other ones, that's just all old stuff. So it takes us out. Okay. Then here's just the article that we briefly discussed last week that are basically, uh, we discussed it last week, so I'm going to skip that. So let's move on to the working groups. Hey, um, Emma? Yes? I just realized you weren't CC'd on something that I should have, that you might want to know about. Um, Karthik is trying to start, and now that I brought this up, I've got to find the email. Karthik is trying to start um, something with ICLR. Okay. Um, and there's, I'll bring you into the discussion, but you can put it on your notes. He's trying to call it um, AI for the planet. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go CC you into this discussion. I, and thought, that's gonna you, be a I thought you were already there. Nope. Okay, uh, some kind of ACLR effort on... It's what ICLR, which is the International Conference on Learning Something. I don't know what the R is. And I think it's learning representation, maybe? Okay, and he says it's, they are specifically asking for AI for social good this year. And so he's trying to propose an AI for the planet has been the discussion. Okay. And I'm sorry I didn't realize you were on there. Christiana's on there and Vipin's on there. And somehow I thought you were on the CC list. So That's fine. I'll get you on there right now. Okay. Thank you. And it may be interesting to other people too. This All is right. Jim Would you mind throwing me on the CC loop for that one as well? Sure. I'll do that right now. Thank you so much. Me too. This is Mary Hill. <laughs> um, yes. Assuming I can find all of your emails off of Daniel's emails, I will do that. Yes. You should. It's mine. Yeah. Okay. okay you, can always, you can always ask me. I know the email addresses. So. Okay. All right, then select the topics from the working group. Uh, I will just jump in for education because I think I'm the only one here today from education. We submitted just before the last Taylor conference, we submitted our revised version of our paper on basically interdisciplinary education at the interface of geosciences and data science. And we're waiting for the second round of reviews. So, and that's the sustainability science journal and we'll just see what happens. Uh, cases are still dormant, so there's not much happening there. I have the feeling there's just not much interest. Uh, modeling. So, is Yolanda on the line? No. Okay, and it doesn't look like much has happened there. Uh, anybody here who wants to talk about adaptive sensing?
No? Okay. Then the International Early Career Committees, that would be mainly uh, Jonas and Suzanne. And I think neither one of them is currently on the call. So we will skip this. Oh, somebody has something to say about adaptive I don't. I don't see Daniel or Mary's email, but I'm going to just add you, Emma, and then you can reply and add them. Yes, I will. Okay. Uh, I was just going to uh, tag uh, Pete, uh, Jamie, and Mike uh, 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 to get whatever, uh, say, news items came from the last meeting. Uh, 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 the previous year, we had well represented at the Earth Cube uh, within the Earth Cube uh, news bulletins, uh, and uh, no, with uh, with one of the articles that was uh, published in uh, uh, given as a news item. So I was just going to tag them to maybe update a news item for Earth Cube on the last uh, on the last um, workshop. Okay, sounds great. Moving on to the futurist working group. The working group hasn't actually met yet, I believe, at least not recently. But Suzanne said she's going to put something on the books very soon. If any, and this is futurist working group is about the future of ISGO. So about where we take this ISGO further, how we want to expand beyond 2020. Um, so if anybody's interested in those discussions, let me know. Um, and we, did, we did meet in uh, June. I think, but we haven't, I, we haven't met since then, but we'll start again. Yep. That was before I joined, so I've never been to any of the meetings. Right. <laughs> so Suzanne yep. said she's going to start again this month, so we'll see what happens. So if anybody is interested, send an email to either Suzanne or me or anyone. All right. As a new subsurface errors working group, anybody here to talk about this? And I think the idea here is that subsurface earth is really, it's usually a little bit neglected in our group. So it's great that some of you start a new working group. If you're interested in that, just contact Michael directly. Um, then I just put an advertisement for a postdoc position that we have at Sierra Boulder. You can just follow the listing over here. It's machine learning for weather applications. So we're looking for a postdoc. Uh, this is a NOAA federal building, which makes it hard for foreigners to get into the building. So people with either green cards or US citizenships are going to have it much easier for that. But we also would have another postdoc position coming up where that isn't a condition. So anyway, if you're at the intersection of machine learning and weather or climate applications, either one of those, um, and you're looking for a postdoc position or any of your students, send me an email. All right. Um, anybody wants to talk about the Open Geospatial Consortia? Nobody here. Okay. Other news, proposals, publications. Um, I will maybe mention that we just got a proposal funded for one of those AGTR framework, um, harnessing the data resolution framework with Vipin Kumar and myself and, uh, and Libby. And I think those are the only ISGO members on that. But that's going to look at physics based machine learning for seasonal to sub season prediction, and maybe Libby will mention that later in her presentation. I can also mention that I got a um, infuse proposal funded from NSF um, that will, involves, um, it's called Futures, F-E-W-T-U-R-E-S, um, and uh, 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 information systems play a big role for us in terms of both analysis of data and communication with stakeholders. Or it will be playing a big part. <laughs> okay, and I would say funded here. Yes. And that's an um, HDR framework. All right. Um, New funding opportunities. Has anybody heard about anything new coming up at the NSF? Many of you may have heard about the Schmidt opportunities. I know that's bringing a bell for anybody for Earth system modeling. But I think the deadline for that is actually in a few days, so it may be a little too late. Anyway. I, I, I can add a uh, watch out for, uh, watch for uh, there's going to be a solicitation for $50,000 uh, grants. Anything that can align with the geocodes project is what we heard back from Eva uh, 
uh, their current, uh, at least EarthCube, currently is, uh, has no budget, but in December, they're going to be releasing a, a I, I guess, re request for proposals that are uh, the smaller $50,000. Any applied use cases that you can think of that would make use of geocodes? Of geocodes, is that, does it capture it then? No, nah, it captures it. Just uh, keep on the lookout for, uh, for those uh, and keep it in the back of your mind if you have a use case. I believe there it's going to be almost entirely use cases is my understanding from Eva. All right. Um, then there are a few other topics. Twitter account, please use it. Slack channel, feel free to use it. Um, and then we're always looking for speakers. So also we have some lined up for the next few talks, but it's always if you know of somebody that you're really excited about and you think everybody would want to hear about them, please let us know. We'd love to have some as guest speakers. I think you all know about ClimateNet. That's CARSIC's uh, effort to get labeled data in, for climate data. And environment seems to be something similar. All right. And Any others? That yes. As you're talking about exciting speakers and that I missed something, your speaker today is an invited speaker at AMFAI in January. Yes, she is. She's, she's also an invited speaker at AGU. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with st starting the presentation a few minutes early, right? And Libby, if you don't mind, I will keep it relatively short. I would, your introduction, I mean. That's great. <laughs> whatever so, you want. I can keep my talk short too, Emma, whatever you want. No, 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 you don't have to. My point is that we have more time for the talk. So um, let me just start by introducing Libby Barnes. Um, so Libby is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences in Colorado State University, but she's also the leading machine learning person in that whole department. So she teaches data science classes and she's going to soon start a machine learning class. Uh, we are both together running a little machine learning club. Um, and then Libby is also going to do a workshop on machine learning for folks because suddenly everybody is hungry for machine learning. And so, um, I've been very fortunate to work with her on, on some research topics, and she's my favorite collaborator, I really have to say. Um, and she's just great, because she has really the full background knowledge of climate, but also of machine learning, and you don't find that that often. So without further ado, I, I would say, take it away. Great, thank you, Emma. Okay, and now I have to not break this. So hold on, share. Just hit the share button at the bottom. Yeah, right. there we go. Can right. you guys see it? Yep, now I'll just make it big. Here we go. Excellent. Perfect. And can you see yourselves? Hold on a second. I see. I'm just going to, there we go. Okay. Um, so actually, this is my, so I am new here as well to ISGO. You actually all heard, I think, from my husband, Patrick Keyes, a year or so ago. Um, so he, he talks to me about ISGO most of the time. Um, I believe he's on one of your working groups. So today I'm going to talk about a um, big general topic, and that is, I'm really a climate scientist, but I, I'm, I'm starting to get into machine learning from really this, you know, as a tool, and I'll tell you more about that. And, and please, since it's not a huge group, if, feel free to, I don't know how you guys normally do it, but if you have questions throughout the talk and, you know, Emma's okay with it, feel free to jump in and ask. It's no fun if I lose you on slide two. Um, so... I want to tell you about using machine learning as a tool to do climate science. And I, I, I can't really start a talk like this without talking about all of the people, hold on, there we go, that I work with here, um, both students within my group, uh, as well as collaborators across the CSU campus, including Emma, you'll see her in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you about it as we go, but uh, um, some of the work um, I will be showing is related to work being done by my PhD st student, Ben Toms. So I sort of framed this talk assuming people didn't, weren't terribly familiar with um, neural networks, and then I'll launch into the actual science that we're doing with them. Okay, so 
typically in geoscience, and maybe this is the wrong crowd, but when I talk to my, my climate colleagues, I sort of start off by saying, we all sort of think of machine learning as some black box where the data comes in, you know, magic stuff happens that we can't see, and then some prediction comes out and we hope that it's right. And so this brings up, you know, the, this, this funny XKCD comic of, you know, this is your machine learning system, the person says, and the guy in the pile says, yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. But what if the answers are wrong? You just stir the pile until they look right. And this is how a lot of people in my field see machine learning, as just a bunch of stirring until the data's maybe look like something you might expect. And they're missing a lot of the science from, the, from it. And so today I really want to talk to you about how we're trying to use it to, to think about some of the science. Um, so machine learning for geoscience is that there's a lot of applications, obviously, outside of the geosciences for um, machine learning tools to perform various tasks. But there are also earth science applications of those same tools. So for example, ob object classification has been used for looking for extreme weather events, um, hurricanes or um, atmospheric rivers. You can say do statistical downscaling and blending of, of high resolution, say precipitation. Or instead of thinking about video prediction, this could be turned into in, in climate science in terms of short term forecasting of say temperatures or, or precipitation. Um, in addition, at least in my field in, in atmospheric science, there's been a lot of focus in the last year and a half or so on convective parameterization. So understanding clouds, where they form and how they form. Um, and this has been in quite a bit and this is where a lot of the excitement is right now, I'd say in my field. Um, but also just in terms, they've been used in terms of predicting the probability of extreme weather. So here's a recent paper looking at predicting extreme hail and how well these different um, methods and tools work. I'm telling you all of this because we're actually not going to do any of the stuff that's being shown on this slide. Instead, I want to talk to you about the issue I deal with in climate, which is climate noise. So the atmosphere is a very noisy place across time scales from day-to-day -day weather to decade-to-decade -to -decade climate. And it can interfere with our understanding of how different parts of the atmosphere talk to other parts of the atmosphere, say if you're trying to predict weather, but it can also impact yearly to multi-decadal variability, say in terms of interpreting where humans are, um, where the impact of human influence is, is really visible. So really it's a, it's a signal to noise problem that we often deal with in climate science. Now, in, in climate science, we have many statistical tools. Not, you know, it's not like we're in the dark here, the Stone Ages. We have many statistical tools to, to look at this problem. For example, something as simple as a linear trend is a very useful tool uh, to, say, identify uh, an upward trend in temperatures over the last 100 years. We also use Fourier analysis or spectral decomposition to look at the frequencies of different phenomena and try and, and interpret what's going on physically there. And we use um, what we call EOF analysis, empirical orthogonal functional analysis, also known to the rest of the world as principal component analysis, to identify patterns and variability in our um, atmospheric system. So we have lots of tools already. And, and in this talk, I just want to suggest that machine learning is really an additional set of tools for the job and is not meant to replace what we already have, but just um, allow us to go maybe into slightly different directions than we would have otherwise. Okay, so now we get, to, we get to the actual science I wanna to talk to you about today, and that's climate change over the 21st century. So what I'm showing here, um, again, from just the last 30 minutes, I noticed that there's a wide range of expertise in the group, so I'll, I'll step through briefly what this plot is. This is a plot of the change in temperature between the end of the 21st century, so 2070 to 2099, minus earlier in the 20th century, so 1920 to 1939. So this is really, if you will, this is our climate change or our global warming signal. The first thing to notice is it's red or at least pink everywhere. That's the fact that the globe is warming. Um, what am I showing you here? This is output across many different climate models that were run um, with similar CO2 concentrations. And I've averaged across all of the models to give you sort of the mean picture of what climate change it will do to temperatures um, in these model simulations. But what you don't see in this plot, well, I should mention, notice how the high latitude Arctic is the reddest. Um, this is a well-known fingerprint of climate change, namely that the Arctic warms faster and more than the rest of the globe. What you don't see in this picture, though, is 
you know, various forms of uncertainty or error bars. So there are really three main forms of uncertainty um, that we talk about in climate. Um, there, and I'll, I'll step you through each one. So the first is scenario uncertainty. And it's the idea that what, what humans, what we choose to do with policy and our CO2 emissions is obviously going to greatly impact how much the globe warms over the next, say, 100 years. So here's a plot looking at diff two different climate scenarios, one more extreme than the other, uh, and showing that this is the total global average change in temperature. And depending on what track humanity takes, it could warm more or less than the others. And the plot I'm showing you um, of a temperature. Oh, is someone asking me a question? No. Okay. Um, so we have that sort of form of uncertainty. We call that scenario uncertainty because we're not sure what scenario humans are going to follow. The second is structural model uncertainty or the fact that our different climate models do different things because they were coded by different people and they have different physics encoded inside them. And that's really the spread you see in this plot. So the fact that there's a, a, a window of red shading is trying to capture the different projections by different climate models, just purely because of their different physics. They've all had the same anthropogenic forcing, the same aerosols, the same CO2 emission, but they, I, they disagree on the physics within the model. I have a question. Yeah. This is Mary Hill. Isn't it yeah. not just physics, but also numerics? Different numerics? There it are different numerics, absolutely, yes. Um, the, I, I think overwhelmingly, the, it's really the physics that, that's going to cause that spread, but you're absolutely right. You know, what, what resolution they run out, even as simple as that. Thank you. And all of that is, is put yeah. into the structural model uncertainty. Oh. Okay, and I'm sorry, can I just ask, what, okay. just a, a related, um, the, um, 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 are you clear, is it, my understanding was some of these models were complicated enough that people didn't completely understand what the physical differences were between them. Am I hopefully wrong about that and that they're really very clear? Well, um, I have to be careful I answer that. Um, each piece of these models mm -hmm. has been coded up by someone that knew what they were doing. However, Right. So if, if you want to add, if you want to understand any piece of one of these models, you know, we could point you to the person that knows exactly what's going on. Where this gets complicated is the fact that you have all of these different pieces talking to each other in nonlinear ways that can feed back in various right. feedback loops. So ultimately, if you want to know why one model has a red blob over, you know, Mexico and the other has a blue blob, uh, that is where, if you will, the climate scientists have their work cut out for them. I understand. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Okay, and then the last one is internal variability. So even if we knew exactly what humans were going to do, and even if we knew um, exactly which model was, quote, the right one, we'd still have internal climate variability to deal with. And this idea of internal climate variability is unbelievably powerful and really what I spend most of my time studying. And it's this, if you will, the butterfly effect, if you've heard that for weather. This idea that the flap of a butterfly wings in, in one part of the globe can totally change the weather elsewhere. And that operates across time scales. That's not just a weather thing. It also is important for climate. And so one way that climate scientists have shown this, I think beautifully, is using what we call large ensembles. So what they've done is they've taken exactly the same model. So there's no model uncertainty. It's exactly the same model and exactly the same forcing. So in this case, the most extreme climate change scenario. And they've run it um, over and over 30 different times with tiny changes to the initial conditions of the simulation. And by tiny, I mean we're talking round off error of 10 to the minus 14th Kelvin at the initial, is the only difference at the beginning of these runs. But what you see in these maps that I've shown you, this sort of stamp plot here, are various trends in temperature over the historical period in all of these different simulations. And if you look, there are certainly similarities. The Arctic gets warmer in almost all of them, but you also see differences. So if you focus in on where you live, you may notice um, some of the simulations show warming and some show cooling. And these differences cannot be attributed to the model and cannot be attributed to differences across the area because they're all the same. This is just showing that climate noise can really interfere with our interpretation of trends um, across the globe. And if you notice in the bottom right-hand corner, I'll blow it up, this is what the observations look like. 
And in many ways, as we think about the observation as just one simulation of many that could have happened. And so part of the job is figuring out which signals when we see them are due, say, to anthropogenic warming or to, to you know, CO2 emissions by humans, and which signals would have been there anyway, if you will, because of climate noise. And that's why this, this is a tricky problem. Okay, so the average of the simulations gives the force response, but the real world's only one of these. What are we doing? <clears throat> so neural networks, so the, this is the tool we're gonna use today. And typically we think about this as a silly little example with a dog and a cat, and we want our network to predict whether you know, we, we gave it a picture of a dog or whether we gave it a picture of a cat. And what I'm gonna tell you is today in my example, I don't totally care whether it's a dog or a cat. I'm gonna say, make that prediction, but then I wanna look inside the network and ask, why did you think it was a dog? And maybe we can learn something new about, about climate um, by understanding the thinking of the network or the reasoning of the network. Okay, so here we go. So if you're not familiar with neural networks, quickly, it's, it's really linear regression with a small little tweak at the end. So if you have your inputs, two values, say x1 and x2, the way we think about this is it's really just those different inputs multiplied by a weight, w1 and w2, and then add it up. And if you look in the bottom of the blue circle, I have a w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b. And that should be familiar as just a regression problem where b is you know, your y-intercept, or um, known as your bias or your offset. Now what's fancy about neural networks is right after you get that output, um, before you pass it along, you push it through a nonlinear activation function. And this is where the magic happens because it allows this otherwise linear regression problem to become nonlinear and learn very complex structures within your data. So this is just one zoomed in picture, but then you can imagine connecting these different inputs and these different blue nodes and doing the sums and applying the activation function and then passing that to another node that applies sums weights and activation functions, et cetera, to get very complex structures. And this is what we're going to be using here um, for, this, for this work. So what are we doing? Okay, we are gonna train one of these neural networks to predict the year of a map. So this is important, this is my whole talk pretty much in this slide. So let's step through it quickly, or sorry, slowly. Definitely not quickly. Um, what am I gonna do? I am going to take maps of surface temperature from my climate model simulations. Each one will represent the, the average over an entire year. So it's the annual mean temperature map. An example is shown on the left-hand side. So we have, you know, it's warmer in the tropics, colder at the poles, that's good. Um, so we're gonna give it a map, and what we want it to do is look at that map and predict what year that map came from. So this is sort of my cat-dog example, but instead of feeding it pictures of a cat or a dog, I'm gonna feed it a picture of the annual mean temperature over the globe. And instead of predicting a dog or a cat, I just want to tell it to tell me the year that that map is from. So before I get into, you know, why, you know, what's the point of this and, you know, uh, how useful is it, I like to test this on something we know won't work. It should fail. And our example is, let's take data from a long model simulation where there is no forcing. That is, every year would be like every other year, except for climate noise. Except for the fact, you know, some years there's an El Nino and other years there's a La Nina. And if we do that, we get the following plot. So what am I showing you? On the x-axis is the actual year of the map. And on the y-axis is the map that the neural network predicted. The gray dots are my training data, and you can see it looks great. I mean, it looks amazing. It gets the year almost exactly right. However, this is because it's overfitting it drastically, because the black is our maps or my testing data it's never seen before. And it really has no idea what year any one map came from because there's really nothing to learn. Every year is just like every other year, except for climate noise. So we've really set up the neural network to fail. And honestly, we did this first just to make sure that our intuition, you know, was, wasn't out to lunch. So let's go back and think about what, what we're trying to do if we look across climate model simulations with um, human forcing. 
So again, what we wanted to do is we want the neural network to learn the regional signals that are reliable indicators of the year. And where will those regional signals come from? They're going to come from the human impact or from the, 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 um, the different forcings that we've put into these simulations. So where humans are actually impacting that, that region, say in terms of temperature. So recall, this is what it looks like when we feed it data that we know won't work because there is no human signal in there. And this is what we get when we feed it model simulations, um, so our, our, our state-of-the-art climate models with our best guess of future CO2 emissions. And I should say, I'm saying CO2, but it's really many different forcing agents, but CO2 is the dominant one, that and aerosols. So what do we see? Well, first of all, it's not scattered all over the place. Secondly, you probably can't really see the gray dots because they're hiding underneath our testing data, which is shown in colored dots. The different colors denote different climate models that I withheld so that the neural network had never seen before. Um, you probably can't see my mouse. Okay, so a few things to note. First, you'll see that it, in the 1920s, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, the neural network doesn't do a terribly good job. At first, you might say, oh, Libby, you didn't do a very good job training your model. Better luck next time. But actually, physically, this makes sense because in these earlier decades, there really isn't a very strong human signal yet. And remember, this signal has to emerge from our butterfly effect or from our climate noise, and it has to emerge from the fact that all the models have to generally, all the climate models have to generally agree on what this response would be because the neural network needs to learn it, and it can only learn something that's consistent within our training data. But after about the 80s or so, it sort of looks like our, our dots will start aligning with the one-to-one. -one. And the one-to-one -one line here means a perfect prediction. And by the time we get to the end of the 21st century, we're with our, the neural network can guess the year within about 10 years, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so one way we tested whether you know, this was actually meaningful is we then went and said, well, wait a second, we now have a neural network and we can feed it maps from any source and have it predict the year. Why don't we feed it maps from the observations? So the true maps of the annual mean temperature that we've all experienced over the last few decades. And when we do that, I was very surprised. Um, and if you were all sitting in the room, I'd make you all ooh and ah, but you don't have to unmute yourself. Because I never expected this to work this well, actually. Um, this is the year that the neural network predicts from our observed temperature maps. And the point is here that overall, the prediction isn't terrible. What that means is the neural network has learned patterns in the climate model simulations that are also present in the observations. Otherwise, it would never be able to predict what year those maps were from. Let me, can I ask a question? Could you, <laughs> could you explain what best observations means in this case? Oh, it could be anything. In this case, these are just, this is just one data set of observed surface temperatures over the last, say, 80 years or so. I, I think, my, I think key, my key point is that best doesn't mean you pick the best ones that fit no, the best. No, unfortunately, that was their acronym. It's for Berkeley. That's the B. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks. Emma. Liz, are you sure it's, this is Liz Moyer. Are you yeah. sure it's picking out pattern information and it's not picking out just overall magnitude? Like, how can you distinguish those two things? You're, you're stealing my punchline. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, this is great. That's an awesome question. Um, from the information I've given you so far, the answer is no, I can't be sure. However, I will, in two slides, I will, I will convince you it's picking out patterns. That's a great question. Um, but quickly, I just want to show that if I put my 1850 control simulation through, it's another test to make sure that it's really learning of some forced response. We see that the model looks at those 1850 control maps and says, hey, these must be from the earlier part of the record because these are not consistent with what's going on later on in the period. Now, as Liz says, well, wait a second, you know, We've all seen the hockey stick plot of global mean temperature going up. How do we know this? Your fancy neural network isn't just taking an average over the whole globe and saying, hey, that's a pretty good guess of what the year is. And, and this actually, after we first got these results, we got excited for about 48 hours and then we said, oh no, it's probably just guessing from, or it's probably just estimating it from the global mean temperature. So what we did is we then re-ran and retrained the model 
where every single map we took out the map's mean. So in essence, we removed the global mean temperature from every single map that we fed it. And that way it could only learn patterns because the global mean was always zero. And when we did that, these are the results that we got. So they are certainly not as good as when the annual mean is still in, in there, but they're not terrible either. Um, one interesting thing, or two interesting things first, is you see that one of the model become, models becomes quite offset from the rest. And what this shows is a delayed response in this model. In essence, the neural network still knows what order the years are going in, but it thinks it's a few decades um, earlier than it actually is. And so this particular model has a different timing of its regional patterns compared to the other climate models or the training data. The second thing you'll notice is that the observations have now been shifted um, about 20 years or so, so later. And this implies that while in the global mean, the OBS and the, um, lined up well with the actual year, once you remove the annual mean and you start focusing on the patterns or the regional signals, it looks as though to the neural network, the observations, it's actually 20 to 30 years further into the future, or the observations are warming faster in this regional sense than, than the climate model simulations. Libby, okay. can I ask again, uh, what's your, your training data is a mishmash of all the models, or what, what is the training data? Yep, so the training data is, a, is uh, we withheld 23 of the models and then fed in the other six for testing. So we withheld entire models. Oh, right I see. Now we're, we're training over all of the CMIT-5 models, and I'll, I'll get to this, but one of the reasons is I want to find patterns that are consistent and reliable across model simulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have done runs where we look at one single model and we look at many, many ensemble members. Mm -hmm. um, and that works really well, but you start to wonder, what if, what if that model doesn't do it right? Right, of course. Just training. And actually, in that scenario, um, the observations do not work very well. And it's largely because we're overfitting to one specific model simulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wondered if you might have like... Yep different patterns and different spatial relationships and different models that might cancel each other when you were mixing them together? Certainly. And, and if that happens, then the neural network says, this is not useful. I'm going to ignore it. Right. Yep. So you're saying it doesn't happen. You have some useful information. You might be losing something or, yep. or blurring something, but there's at least enough there. Exactly. In the case, as usual, where the multi-model mean somehow has more characteristics, more similarity to reality than an individual model does. Yes. And that's, that's sort of what we're finding here. I mean, it's possible that there are, you know, it's possible that half of the climate models have some signal that's real, that, that's, that's truth and that the real world has, but the other models don't. And so the neural network's ignoring that. So there's right. certainly, um, this is, if you will, uh, this, could, this, this isn't everything that could be happening in the observations, obviously. But it's saying, I was hey, actually wondering if there was a way, and I don't want to, I should stop because I'm interrupting your talk, but no, okay. if, if yeah. there was a way that you could use this to ask which uh, model has a spatial relationship that most resembles observations. Right, so I think you can. I think now that we've sort of set this up and show that it works, you can start using this for model evaluation. Exactly. In the sense that I'm showing you here that suddenly we've learned something about this, this French model, this blue model, that maybe wouldn't have been as easy to, to figure out earlier mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there is a place for model evaluation with these tools, absolutely. Because if you okay. train on each individual model, then you can ask how well are the OBS predicted by a training on that model, and some models will look like they predict the observations better than others, and isn't that a diagnostic right there? Yes, except those models would have to have many ensemble members, because we need multiple realizations of the year, say, 1980, to train it. Right, but we have, we have these big ensembles now. Exactly. So yes, we have done this with one of those ensemble members and then over the next few months, I'm currently getting data now to do it across like the, the Canadian and the German large ensembles. Cool, cool, great, yep. awesome, sounds yep. great. I think that is the, one of the cool steps forward. So yes, thank you. Okay, so um, I don't wanna take up all, all, all my time here, but I quickly wanna say, you know, I've shown you I can predict the year, but if you really think about it, we don't really care what year it is because at the end of the day, the net CDF file or, or my, my CSV file tells me what year it is. So I haven't actually learned all that much. Um, the real trick here is what, what weights are being learned inside this neural network that's allowing it to do such a good job at predicting the year. 
And to do this, I, I'm going to breeze through a method um, called layer-wise relevance propagation that uh, Emma and I and my group are quite excited about. And it helps to understand how a decision was made about with a particular input within a neural network. For example, if you look on the right-hand side, the inputs could be numbers, handwritten numbers. And on the right-hand side, this method will give you, you know, light up the regions that were important in making the decision that that was, say, a two or a one or a zero. So what we can do is say, what regions of my input map were important to make the prediction of the year 2010 or 2080? And my graduate student, Ben Toms, is currently writing up a paper describing this for its applications in climate. So let me show you what we can do. We're calling these indicator patterns. They are not the climate change signal. That's shown in the upper right-hand corner. There's no question that is the forced response to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. But instead, we're looking at what regions are the best indicators of a human influence. And this is really made up of three pieces. First, where the, the forced response or the, the impact is large, so the climate change amplitude, where internal variability is small, and where the models tend to agree. All three of those are going to be lumped into these patterns. And using this layer-wise relevance propagation method, we can make maps, for example, in the upper left-hand um, um, is 1955, we have 2005 and 2085. So if we focus on 2085, we can look at the regions that were most important for the correct prediction of 2085. And we can start trying to understand why were those regions so important um, and what signals were popping out. One thing I found very interesting, and you can't see it here, but if you look at 2005 and you look over China, you see sort of a, a black, black blob. And the more we've looked at this, that looks like it's the aerosol signal being picked up over, over Eastern Asia. Um, so we can start to look at these patterns and say, you know, why is the North Atlantic so important in 2085? And again, this could be because of, for those of you familiar, of the warming um, hole in that region. So we're starting to analyze these maps and understand why are those regions considered the reliable um, locations to look for predicting the year. Okay, and since um, I'm almost out of time here, quickly, uh, I do want to point out that you may have thought the Arctic would be a really important indicator of climate change, but it's really not that important at all. And the reason is actually because while the Arctic is expected to warm the most, it also has some of the most noise or internal variability um, across, across the globe. And so while the signal is expected to be big, so is the noise and the models disagree largely on this signal. And so the neural network has decided, if you will, not to look there. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that slide. And I, I just wanna show you that you may be underwhelmed with temperature, but we've also successfully done this with precipitation. And that's shown here. Um, it doesn't look as good as temperature, but um, again, we are looking at maps of annual mean precipitation and how that changes in response to anthropogenic um, climate change. And the OBS, or the observations are shown in the white dots, N nowhere near as good as that for temperature, but generally you'll see that the white dots do, um, are in generally the correct order, suggesting that there is a pattern in the observations that's found within these climate models. And is finally, this the one that's, de is this demeaned or is this the leaving this the annual mean? Yeah. But this is demeaned, but for precipitation, it turns out it makes very little difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. And finally, I just want to point out that while temperature, I haven't shown you, is actually largely linear, for precipitation, if we did the linear model, um, on the right-hand side, you see that it fails quite a, it, it doesn't do a good job, whereas the left-hand plot is for the nonlinear um, neural network, suggesting that the nonlinearities are important for this, for this variable. Okay. So with that, um, I, I have just two slides about general, and this is work of things I've been thinking about with Emma, and so maybe I'll just skip quickly over them. But the idea that I think machine learning and geoscience is a really, really special thing, especially because in geoscience we have physical laws and principles that other areas um, utilizing machine learning do not. Um, and a way forward is this idea of physics-guided machine learning. And there have been some applications looking at um, determining the, the, the temperature distribution through a profile in a lake and in 
requiring that certain physical laws are, are met when the neural network is trying to learn the patterns it sees. And that indeed learning the physics and incorporating the physics does help with the, the ultimate prediction on data it's never seen before. All right, so my, my summary here is that this, the rapid rise of machine learning is really bringing an old conflict of physics-based versus data-oriented methods to the forefront of earth science research. But this isn't new. This is something I think, at least in my field, we've been struggling with for decades. And obviously, its thoughtful use is essential to do good science. Um, so machine learning offers additional tools for the job, but I always say this for my students because they start getting nervous. You know, it doesn't replace the science or the scientists. There's still truly a role for, for the scientists to play. Um, and that they can be used for more than just prediction. And that's where my group is, is really going right now, is we're really excited about how we can couple these, these architectures in creative ways to, to learn new science um, and where maybe the prediction wasn't the ultimate goal. And I'll put up a picture. Um, by Emma's son, and I'll take questions. So thank you. Hi, this is this is Mary Hale. This is completely awesome. So really, really exciting to see. I just had one question on your last graph three slides ago. Your, yeah, do you want me to go back to it? Yeah, yeah. I just okay. wanted to know if the gray dots were the training. Yep, the gray dots are the training here. And so you'll it, like in this case, you see that the testing data is actually slightly shifted. Yeah, it's all shifted, and the data is shifted in the same direction. Yeah. Um, Whatever that means. Yeah, and that, that could just be, you know, the, the particular models I happen to choose in my training versus testing aligned mm -hmm. in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great observation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, hello, uh, this is Jian Wang Wang from UMBC. I have a quick question. Uh, thanks. Um, so for the for the training GCM model, you or do you use a picture for the training, or use the the variables? Um, uh, how many? If you use a variable, how many variables you use for the training? Uh, for all of it, I'm only I. Other than this plot, all the the results you saw was I only use temperature, and I'm always feeding it a map of um, annual mean temperature. So in essence, it's sort of like an image, you know, a picture of a dog. Only it's a picture of temperatures over the globe. Okay, so the one, if you, you have removed the annual mean, so what's left uh, if you remove that? If you remove, no, no, I didn't remove the annual mean, I removed the global mean. A oh, global mean, okay. Yep. And as, so, okay, as we know, you know, uh, the, the uh, GSM has so many variables generated. Uh, do you think that having more variables, will you having the prediction better? That's a great question. Um, so obviously, as you add more inputs, it will always it will be able to overfit to its heart's content. However, yes, my feeling is especially if, uh, temperature is a pretty big one. But if you say couple temperature and precipitation together in the inputs, one would hope that the neural network would be leveraging information that's unique to each to do an even better job. And that's actually the topic of a recently funded NOAA proposal that Emma and I are both on to try and understand how combining the different variables, and not just the variables, but also say seasonality. We know that there are certain seasonal um, responses to, in temperature, say in precipitation across the globe. And so if we input say summer and winter separately, does that help? That's one of the questions we wanna ask. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions for Debbie? Yeah, this is Jim Franke from Chicago. Uh, thanks for the talk, Libby. Um On the resolution of the different models, are you regridding them uh, to like the one degree that the observations at is, or are you just leaving all native re at the native resolution? Yeah, so we definitely had to regrid. Um, I've done this both at, let's see, I think it was at two by two, and then I've also done it at four by four, and really. The, four, the, the slightly lower resolution did fine because I'm, I'm attempting to pick up large regional patterns. The reason you def we definitely had to regrid is we're doing a form of um, ridge regression to make sure that we're picking up patterns rather than individual grid points that are important. And because of that, we could get very different answers purely from you know, the number of grid points that are showing up in the different models. So everything's been regridded. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Libby, thank for a great talk. Everybody.
Yes, thank okay. you. Yeah, and um, we recorded this talk, so we're going to put this up as soon as possible. And with that, I think we conclude the meeting, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you.